quick introductions. Um, I'm Jane Secker, I'm a senior lecturer at City University, uh, where I'm also programme director of our Masters in Academic Practice. Um, I'll get my colleagues to come up and introduce themselves. So it's going to be a three way thing. I'm doing very little and they will be mainly presenting. So I'm Geraldine Foley, Educational Technologist at City University. Hi, I'm Sarah Reimers, I'm a research fellow at City University as well. Okay, so the title of our talk is uh, Community Belonging and Placemaking in Online and In-Person Teaching Context. Um, in 2021, 2021, yes, we were very fortunate to have a COVID funded study um, where uh, we were looking at some of our students' experiences of studying um, online. So we are pulling out some more of the data we collected during that study and telling you a bit about it. But before we start, what we would like to do, if I can get these slides working, yeah, um, we have um, a poll that we would like you um, to complete. So if you could go to uh, pollev.com gf10, and uh, we would like to find out from the room what your thinking is. So if you have to attend a large group meeting, it's taking place online, and you're not that familiar with the subject, what would be your preference? So you've got three choices. Would you uh, watch online with your camera on and ask questions? Would you watch online with your camera off and use the chat to ask questions? Uh, or you wouldn't watch it online at all, but you would um, catch up on the recording later and probably watch it at double speed to try to get through the bits that were maybe not so interesting to you. So let's see. Uh, so far, most people oh, most people are saying first option, watch online with the, oh no, that's not first option, sorry. Camera off and use the chat. Ask, so ask the middle one, is that the middle one? Middle one, yeah. yeah. That's far and above actually the most popular. So yes. interesting. You didn't have camera on. And you no, well, we should have done multiple different yes. variations, shouldn't we? We're trying to make it as simple as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we'll add that as an additional one. Yeah. Okay, we wanted to just kind of get a bit of a sense. I guess one of the things that we're very aware of with online teaching is, you know, student experiences um, don't always mirror what they say they want as well, but kind of putting yourself in the position of the students when you're shifted online. There's a, a lot of students, obviously, not very happy in a large space where they don't necessarily know everyone online and not that familiar with the subject. So it's not that surprisingly worth putting cameras on. So are we all right? Can I go back to my slides? No. Okay. Right. So what I'm going to do is just do in uh, a couple of minutes I've got is just give you a little bit of background about the project that we did at City University and I'll then hand over to Geraldine and Sarah who are going to talk you through some of our findings um, from the data analysis. So the, um, okay, so the project um, was called Learning Online with International Politics. Um, as I said, the research was funded um, by um, the uh, Code uh, Centre for Distance and uh, Education, and um, we have our final report up um, available, that was all sent in last year. We did speak about some of this research at the conference last year as well. Um, what was interesting was um, that we chose our Department of International Politics because they took a very specific strategy with teaching online during the pandemic where they wanted students working online. They did a, they did a lot of asynchronous um, teaching and then they had a lot of group activities for students and they were trying to plan it um, as a department. So we thought it'd be really interesting to find out um, what the students actually thought of this kind of more strategic approach. Um, we um, have quite an interesting um, department. So um, international politics um, is, uh, I've got some numbers, I think on the next slide, um, but you know, quite a, a decent size undergraduate cohort. Um, but at City, many of our students are often the first um, in their family to go to university. So big widening participation cohort. Also lots and lots of commuting students. And some of the data from um, the JISC um, Digital Insight Survey of our students shows um, that there is quite a high level of 
<clears throat> digital poverty at City. So we had quite a lot of students with issues where in the pandemic they just didn't have suitable devices. Quite a lot of them, 10% uh, saying that they didn't have safe places to work um, and um, reporting issues with the cost of um, mobile um, data and things like that. We had some sort of principles for how to um, shift your teaching online. And as I say, a lot of what the international politics department did was they tried consistently to sort of follow um, the guidance that we were giving about using asynchronous learning, uh, pre-recorded lectures with some guided activities. <clears throat> this was the kind of the key uh, research question that we're going to talk about today, though, from the data, which was the factors that might impact on whether students participate actively with online learning and with the asynchronous resources. So we got lots and lots of data from um, student focus groups and from a survey. Um, and what we've done is Sarah's gone back into our data and re-analyzed it so we can have a look at some of the sort of key themes. Um, that's just a bit about uh, the student. So We've got six, 677 um, undergraduate students. We did have a smaller cohort postgraduates who completed the survey um, or the survey was open to, 83 actually responded. But then we, we did focus groups um, with uh, our first, second, third years and with some uh, postgraduates. So we've got quite a lot of rich qualitative data, which we've been analyzing and we've got it all coded up in in vivo. Um, I'm going to hand over to Geraldine at this point. So when we were here at the conference last year, those of you who were here, um, Dave White did a keynote about the water cooler moment and was talking about belonging. And we were struck by, as we've been reading all our data, that this seemed to be a bit of a theme. It wasn't something we'd initially been looking for in the data, but something that was there quite evident mm -hmm. when we were reading our focus group data. So I'll hand over to Sheldon. Thank you. So we wanted to explore how community belonging and placement and <coughs> all of these might have impacted students' active involvement with the asynchronous content and activities. So just to go back to um, the theories of belonging, where well, there isn't a, a set definition, like all these things is a bit vague. We've got a couple of definitions traditions up there. So a feeling of connectedness, one that's important to another and that you matter, or um, as Min and Travis have it, it's a belief and expectation that you fit into the group and have a place there, being accepted. But there's not um, one set definition, but there's lots of research that shows that it's quite crucial to student retention and progression. And um, it's starting to become something that's um, being measured with the Office for Students Blended Learning Review as community building as a key aspect. So it's starting to become more on people's radar. And, and particularly um, during and after the pandemic, the emergency shift to online learning led to more complex understanding of belonging and the fact that we can't really rely on just having a campus to automatically foster students together and make them feel like they belong to the university. And the fact that it's actually quite a complex thing that, you know, your identity is changing all the time and it's diverse and multiple and um, it's not fixed. It's constantly changing. So you might have feelings of belonging and belonging at the same time. And also that students are more and more diverse nowadays and they won't necessarily be able to get involved in institutions in the same way that traditionally perhaps they would have and, and the traditional ways of maybe fostering senses of belonging up, not working for these new cohorts. Um, so one of the big key studies that's happened recently, and in fact, in the same time frame as our study, was a, a year-long um, study uh, that Wonky and Pearson did, and it was based on large amounts of quantitative and qualitative data. So they collected it in autumn 2021, so around the same time as us doing our study, and um, they worked with student unions and universities to hold focus groups, they collated monthly anonymous diaries from students and they got um, large numbers of survey responses. So over 5,000 students and 430 staff responded. And um, their uh, report, which you can see online, has four main um, <coughs> pillars of belonging, foundations of belonging, which were connection, inclusion, support and autonomy. And they had re recommendations for all of those four areas. And, and that really did influence us when we were starting to go back to our data and, and re-looking at it in terms of the areas of belonging, which 
brings on to Sarah. Brilliant, thank you. So yeah, we thought today that we'd focus specifically on the subject of connection and um, the, the various elements of it that emerge in the um, in the sort of wonky framework and thinking about how that, that emerged in our own data as well. So um, there were multiple challenges, obviously, within the, the pivot to online learning that occurred during the, the pandemic um, that emerged frequently in our discussions in the focus groups in terms of uh, some of those challenges to forging connections. And today we wanted to focus specifically on three of the core themes that emerged, which were um, issues with students having their cameras off and the challenges that that, that sort of posed to forming connections um, between peers. Issues with synchronous and asynchronous communication, so thinking about uh, the ways in which um, uh, both peers and tutors are communicating and an overall kind of sense of loss that we've categorised as uh, a loss of spontaneity, but also a sense of what was missing from their experience, what was missing from that connection and community as a result of the move online. I'll hand over to Geraldine to talk about it. Yeah, so the first thing that we were looking at was um, students' presence and the um, reluctance to turn on camera. So this was the most frequently cited challenge from our participants, um, students not having their cameras on in online seminars um, and tutorials. It came up in the survey and the focus group. And um, as a Wonky report noted, getting to know uh, their peers has a profound effect on students' sense of belonging because it enables them to build a support network and develop confidence. And uh, looking back at um, Dave's White, Dave White's um, discussions of that, he was saying how online conference platforms have no sense of space or location and having your camera on can be quite exhausting and doesn't give you that sense of connection that being in the, the room does. And he recommended using alternative tools such as collaborative documents and online whiteboards, which help sort of uh, spatialized thoughts and location of individuals in a shared space and using that to generate a sense of co-presence rather than just having the camera on. But um, some quotes that we have up here, um, so a lot of people will switch off their cameras and microphones and even leave when you get into breakout rooms because they don't want to talk to understand, some people are more comfortable, um, whereas in person you can kind of coax things out of each of people and feel more comfortable. And then we've had another one, um, about miscommunication and missing verbal cues. So how we tend to be quite sarcastic and make jokes, but you can't really do that if it's just like a black screen because it could be taken serious and you lose a lot of the non-verbal cues. So you're not sure if you're talking too much or not enough. And then we had another one about um, how you'd be walking around the room and do something else and not be fully engaged because if you didn't have the camera on, no one could see and that affects everyone because then maybe you go into a breakout room and they're not actually there. So that led to lots of uh, mentions about lack of motivation and how, because people didn't have their cameras on, I think we had one student say, I only go to online sessions to meet people. And if they're not there, well, what's the point? Might as well watch the recording afterwards and not getting anything out of, of attending live. Um, and yeah, so the next point that we had sort of related generally to sort of anxiety about sort of the potential awkwardness of communication. So one of the things that emerged was um, issues around slow or disrupted internet connection, which I'm sure we've probably all experienced at some point <laughs> during the pandemic, but, um, but this anxiety that that leads to um, a desire to opt out or not to, to sort of participate in, in group discussion, as you can see from the, the quote on the board, this sort of the organism of disrupting the flow of conversation and perhaps that being something that you sort of step back from. So that was an issue in terms of student presence in relation to, to synchronous communication. But we also found as well that asynchronous communication was something that emerged as a particular challenge. Um, firstly, in terms of email correspondence, this was something that um, students in the focus groups reported as being a challenge both in terms of peer response and tutor response, this idea that, that it's easier for people not to respond to emails, that they might be waiting for a while to reply. I mean, obviously we have to think of the context of it, it was during the pandemic, there were challenges people were experiences, but experiencing, of course, um, but kind of thinking about what that means in terms of communication and how that's different from, from um, a, an in-person learning experience. And also in, in terms of feedback, so we've got issues in relation to, to um, 
uh, student presence and also uh, tutor presence in um, when students didn't receive feedback from work that they'd done online, particularly from asynchronous activities, it demotivated them from, from uh, participating in that those activities going forward so it was it was something that perhaps if they did want but then didn't get feedback from if there wasn't that tutor presence if there wasn't that kind of um communication and connection between the um student and the tutor that was something that going forward they decided not to to take part in as, as the quote on board says so sort of a sense that they could use their time better if they weren't going to be getting feedback um and as I mentioned when I talked about the beginning at the beginning of this section, this sort of idea of this sense of loss, and I think this was something that we were quite struck by when we first returned to the data, um, and this idea that students were really feeling what they were missing out on, and and what the difference was between their online experience and the experience they envisaged that they would be having were their learning taking place in person. Um, and so there were lots of references to, oh, if we were in person, we could do this. And, and we sort of um, categorise these as lots of, of spontaneity and lots of those opportunities for spontaneous uh, connection. And um, so, for example, we had um, the particular uh, pressures on time and space. So things like um, the fact that if seminar a seminar discussion was really interesting and people were really engaged then perhaps they would um continue on in the space if there wasn't uh, another class afterwards but the additional time pressures online and having to sort of go um you know tutors needing to leave and close the room those kind of things were um were challenges that students identified and um, there were also um fewer opportunities for um uh, impromptu conversations and sort of uh, informal coffees. These are things that, that often emerged as a, a really important part of that connection. It goes back to that sort of placemaking <coughs> experience of, of belonging in, in terms of where the way you, different ways you can connect when you're in person. Um, and I think this is such a great quote. You can't casually go for a coffee after an asynchronous lecture. I think, yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> we can see that. And that this idea of this awkward pre-organising, this sort of awkwardness in, in communication and connection that, that was coming up as, as a theme. And that ultimately, um, this led to a, um, a demotivation in terms of learning, which I think that was important. Right? Yeah, so just these challenges it affected student learning. Um, many participants commented on the lack of opportunities for interacting with peers and their teachers in order to check on their knowledge, consolidate their learning, and how that led to loss of motivation to attend online seminars as a, as a result. Um, students often recognise the role that teachers can play in structuring and facilitating peer collaboration and discussion, and uh, the benefits of asynchronous learning activities were often recognised but um, as uh, Sarah said, the students often admitted that they would only complete these asynchronous activities if they knew they would be followed up by the teacher, either in the live session or with some form of feedback. Um, and there's a quote there about um, people finding it quite hard to, um, because they're shyer and they have to Google their own questions. It's difficult to motivate yourself. Um, oh, um, and I had a quote here that, um, on the asynchronous activities I found when they were done, they were really helpful. So as long as they were followed up on, if they were done and then left, then I didn't think they served a particular function. And someone else fell out doing it because they just wasn't, just didn't really, they weren't marked. They didn't really get that much out of it. Um, so they didn't really do that many activities. Brilliant. So as you can see, um, the students in the focus group felt that, that these uh, opportunities to connect were really integral to their experience of, of learning online during the pandemic. And um, I think this, um, this quotation kind of sums that up in terms of this, this is something that emerged as a theme for students wanting more. And the really significant thing of it being that kind of structured connection. So rather than sending people out into breakout rooms and just saying off you go, um, really having this uh, a, a sort of scaffolded approach to, to those opportunities for connection. And um, another student in our focus group kind of elaborated on this a bit more. So um, suggesting that rather than having students sitting off, uh, going off into a breakout room and just sitting there in silence, making sure that there's sort of a structured um, uh, brief for them to follow. And so this was something that emerged in terms of uh, ways that it might be possible to, to support students with forming connections. And um, we've got a few um, headings that we sort of, sort of emerged as key points in relation to this. So um, 
we found some examples of best practice that emerged from um, you know, students saying, well, this worked really well, and if we'd only had a bit more of this in our classes, or if we, we could only have had a, um, uh, an opportunity to connect in this particular way. Um, and we've identified kind of three core um, activities that sort of uh, were spoken about frequently. So um, as we uh, sort of experimented with at the beginning of the talk, we have polls and quizzes as a way of sort of forging a connection anonymously within a group of people. And um, we have uh, group work and specifically kind of structured group work, and also some examples of subject specific activities, which emerged as um, particularly beneficial in this, this learning and teaching context. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so polls and quizzes. Um, so as Sarah said, anonymity, promoted participation and that connection with peers and also the competition, checking understanding, people said it incentivized them to actually do the work so they could complete, take part, um, and they felt like they, they got good um, buying from other students, so lots of people were engaging, so they found them uh, useful, and as somebody talked about it being gamified with league tables and having healthy competition. And moving on to group work, um, there was a general preference for individual work, but group work was recognised as a key way of connecting with peers, um, but of course it, it needed careful scaffolding. So um, we've got a quote here for somebody who used Teams and then they did some group work and they found that actually that way they could talk about other modules and have that connection with their students, uh, their peers, um, even if it wasn't the same module they were doing the group work for. Uh, someone else saying that breakout rooms work best when you actually had a bit more structure, otherwise they were just silent and awkward. Um, and we found that uh, students who had a uh, previous experience of group work, particularly um, during the, the immediate lockdown at the end of the, the summer term, found that they, they coped much better and they were able to do asynchronous group work where they could meet up in various ways and do collaborative documents. And they found that actually in some cases it was more successful than back when they were doing group work face to face, whereas those students who hadn't really had much experience of group work really struggled to meet up because they were trying to replicate meeting uh, synchronously. Um, and then moving on to subject specific activities. Brilliant. So um, picking up on what Geraldine said earlier about um, uh, Dave, Dave White's work on placemaking, we were really interested in this uh, particular activity where um, a student, a uh, teacher in one class suggested that um, students should change their profile picture um, to something relevant to the topic of that week and that this is something that um, uh, they would then discuss in the class and vote on a particular uh, you know, winner of the week that raised the most interesting themes. And I think that's a really interesting example of um, creating a sense of place and a collective um, experience without having to have cameras on, without having that particular mode of, of engagement. So um, we thought that was a really interesting example to emerge from, from the discussions. And um, there were also examples of role plays and, and specific um, scaffolded group work that, um, that enabled students to engage creatively um, whilst also having the framework of representing a particular um, particular angle or a particular um, perspective on a topic and so they were able to um, work collectively on that particular issue and it sort of all uh, got brought together at the end of, of the term. And there were also examples of some important um, Sort of extracurricular activities that were um, offered online and um, I think this student puts it nicely with outside of the academicness of the course so um, an example of a lecturer giving and um, hosting a film night with films that were relevant to um, the, the themes that were being covered that week and that opportunity to um, participate in that collective viewing um, albeit um, sort of individually but at the same time by doing it synchronously they were together um, and sort of having that informal opportunity for connection through a kind of um, creating a sense of, of uh, place in terms of a movie theatre or, or that kind of, it, it's slightly different from, uh, from the classroom. Um, so that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour through our, our sort of particular engagement with the data from the, um, the themes of belonging and specifically connection. Um, but in terms of the lessons learned, we sort of returned to the, the wonky framework of student presence, teacher presence, group work and collaboration. And we found that um, in summary, relating to the student presence, we had um, 
that student presence and that creation of, of student presence fostering that connection um, was closely related to issues of both motivation and student satisfaction. In terms of teacher presence, uh, the teacher um, plays a dual role both on the one hand of uh, fostering connection amongst the, the cohort, um, but also the, the presence of the, the teacher in terms of their own uh, presence within with the student uh, cohort as well. So in terms of feedback and email communication, so important for that sense of, of student and um, student connection. And then in terms of group work and collaboration, those uh, sort of those often seen as expendable activities within um, uh, within this very pressurized environment of the pivot online and um, and the, the sort of needing to engage with content, but actually the icebreakers and getting to know you exercises were integral to fostering connection and to, to having um, that sense of student presence that was so important for student engagement. Um, but scaffolding of activities was so essential to their success because you can't just sort of expect people to. Uh, go into a breakout room and, and feel comfortable connecting without um, without some kind of framework for that. And then I'll hand it to Joe. We've got time for a few questions. Well, this is just our last slide. So if we uh, yeah, just okay. sum up. So just to say, this is really important to remember the context of this. It's a really stressful time for academics. They were getting on top of technology, they were moving to online learning, none of these courses had been designed for online delivery, and they had very little time to prepare. So as a consequence, the majority of staff focused on providing asynchronous learning resources over designing and facilitating asynchronous or synchronous learning activities. And we did find in the data, you know, 25% of respondents have been provided with small group discussion in breakout rooms, we don't know how much that was structured. 21% with polls of some sort, 15% with quizzes or collaborative documents or worksheets. And comparing that to um, the GIST uh, survey data at City more widely and in the UK, that wasn't that different, uh, which found that you know collaborative activities, uh, active learning activities were less commonly used because people were just doing the bare minimum, basically. Um, so those that were more confident Technically, they were able to facilitate the learning activities. They had that confidence. They had that base level of understanding for the technical stuff, so they could build on that. Um, and just to say that you know that the department decided to go with this asynchronous approach, but that you know they had very little time to do the pedagogy behind it, so that academics could then apply it to their context. They just were getting. Um, the baseline technical stuff out there in terms of training as well. So um, there's loads of strategies for developing social presence, community, belonging, all of these things. But uh, I suppose as educational technologists, we need to be able to wear the time that active learning requires. And in the sector, we need to um, develop workload models that include time for professional development, course design and preparation, because this really is a bit of a sort of hidden workload that, that does make the difference in terms of whether students engage or not but if we don't acknowledge it you know we'll we'll get, get done <laughs> is, is that final thought well, thank so. you very much thank you very much uh, questions and if anybody online wants to post a question we can try and do that as well so okay. if anybody quick comments or, or questions my son like <laughs> is this, is this that Yes. So yes, it does match my, my experience. Um, I was interested in all your feedback. So uh, slightly provocative question: Did any of the students say anything nice yes. about the online <laughs> experience? <laughs> Yeah, our first study actually, uh, so many of them appreciated the access to um, the asynchronous content. They really, really loved being able to get you know more flexibility, more control over the the time that they studied and how and when they had access to the stuff. So that was a real positive. They really, a lot of them hadn't had lecture had recordings previous to COVID. Yeah, no, we had it. We we reported last year, so we've got um, some slides from last year where we talked about particularly students' experiences of pre-recorded lectures, and they were very positive about those. Anything else you want to be about Sarah, positive? No, I think, and, and certainly students really valued the effort that staff had put into sort of the, the examples of best practice that we um, we identified. Um, so yeah, I think absolutely, you know, there definitely was a sense of there being, being positive, I suppose, and um, we were sort of keen to engage with some of the challenges today, but absolutely, uh, as Jane said, in particular, the yeah, pre-recorded lectures that we were 
um, yeah, seems a really good positive. Any, any final quick comment from me? Anyone in the audience? Anybody else feel as this? Um, they have really had different experiences. All the cameras on, all that they were able to say, so they do experience as well. Okay. I was wondering if you could have found that some of the experiences that you have done online were useful when you look back into a normal classroom. I think that, that was definitely our experience. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had found some uh, use. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think some of the ways that they've been using collaborative documents, particularly um, that everyone had to learn how to do pretty rapidly, that that's definitely continued for group projects. I think, um, but I, I I think also just the, the the continuing. I mean, the department before COVID was actually one of the lowest to be using um, recorded lectures. And so they have moved over. We've gone to a, an opt-out policy in recorded lectures at City. So there are now a lot of recorded lectures. So that's changed quite dramatically because before that, the department were just not, they were, most of them were opting out of it and saying, no, I don't want my lectures that's, recorded. I, 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 although we're running late, mm -hmm. I have got somebody on mine to have a question, Rachel. Just could it be very quick, very but, quick answer, because we need to move on. It was just to say that when you're, all the students have their cameras off, it, it's kind of cultural, isn't it? You have to start as you mean to go on. If you don't start with them on, it's really, really difficult to get students to then turn their cameras on. Mm -hmm. It's kind of 20 or 30 or 100 against one. So I wonder if anyone's got any, I don't, I, I always start with they're all on, but then when I teach other groups who aren't my own, I turn up to a wall of blank screens and I wonder if anyone's had any ideas of things that you can do if all if you start with all the cameras off. Well, I would just bring it back to Dave's white thing that, that turning the cameras on doesn't necessarily foster that sense of connection anyway, and that you have to use alternative methods. So the collaborative documents, the polls, uh, if you do the breakout rooms and maybe you, students will feel more comfortable to be able to turn their cameras on. But it, it's using those sort of ways of forming a sense of space and, and shared content as an alternative to just having a camera on. I think that's the key thing in design as well, yeah. isn't it? Okay, thanks very much. Right. Um, maybe